Good morning. Um, I'm Sharon Alterman, and I'm very happy to be here with Susie Citrin, interviewing her for the Leonard N. Simons Oral History Project. Today is um, Thursday, July 28th, the year is 2005. And before I start the interview, I have to say that Susie is one of the people that made this interview um, series happen, and we're just so grateful to you for all your time and energy that you put into this project. And we can Thank say you. so many things about <laughs> you, Susie, because you're just a wonderful leader in this community. And just reading all about you, the words compassionate, enthusiastic, kind, just kept reoccurring over and over again. So we're very proud of you. I and hope all you're not going to cut this out of the tape. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> so <laughs> let's begin. Let's be at the very beginning. When and where were you born? Um, I was born here in Detroit. I think I've never left this place. Um, I lived on Pasadena be between Homer and Petoskey uh, in the old Jewish neighborhood and grew up there, went to McCullough School, and uh, then moved at the age of eight to Oak Park. But um, my parents, um, as I think perhaps a lot of parents in those days, didn't really investigate school systems. So although we lived in Oak Park, I went to Ferndale school systems. And I first went to Andrew Jackson and then Paul Best which no longer exists. I just went up there a few days ago, and it's now, mm. uh, it's the John F. Kennedy um, Middle School. So uh, it's kind of funny to go and see that it doesn't exist anymore. And uh, then I went to Ferndale High School. So, so let's go back a little. Who were your parents? <coughs> well, oh. my mom, uh, Shirley White was her name. Mm -hmm. uh, she um, was born in Lynn, Massachusetts, and she was from a family of six. And like many families, they all had to work very hard. Uh, she did go to a little bit of college. She went to uh, Wayne State University, which is, um, <coughs> she went to, what, uh, actually when it was a high school, she went to Old Main mm. and when it was a high school. And uh, then, you know, she went to a little bit of s college, but, uh, and my dad, who was born in, in Toronto, um, he came to the States when he was very young. Um, he had a very hard life. I mean, he, he wasn't able to get an education. Um, his father died when he was very young. His mother remarried twice. Mm -hmm. um, he had stepsisters, you know, and uh, he had half-sisters and real sisters, and he had a brother who ran away uh, when he was very, very young because they just had a very tough life. And so he went into the uh, business with my grandfather when my father and mother got married and they opened a little shoe store which was on Six Mile in uh, Livernois uh, near the Varsity um, and uh, that's what he did until um, he couldn't stay there any longer because of the crime and he closed up the store and he worked for Crowley's in his later years mm -hmm. and he actually died on the last day of his retirement. Mm -hmm. um, he went to work and he never came home. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and uh, so they, they I, I came from really meager beginnings. Mm -hmm. And so at an early age, I babysat and brought money home. It wasn't for my use. It was to put into the family kitty. And, um, you know, and when I was 16, I actually got a, a pretty good job. Mm -hmm. So working as a doctor's office as a receptionist. And um, all, I worked my way all through college, uh, went to Wayne, went to Wayne Graduate School. Um, worked in a psychiatric clinic. Um, so uh, when I actually graduated, I had a master's degree in French, and I taught for two years at Wayne and two years at Oakland University. Um, but then uh, I had some children, they came along. So that was, uh, <laughs> in, in those days, uh, women didn't ha have careers. They, they chose usually to stay at home with the kids. So uh, there I was. What are your children's names? Um, well, Laura's the oldest. She's 33. And then there's Willie. Um, he's 30. And Johnny is uh, 29. And they're all characters and <laughs> fun. And they get along really well. And we love them. They're all over the place, as you know. So, Where do they live? Uh, well, Laura lives in Manhattan. And she's a television producer. And she just recently got married. And uh, Willie lives in Kuala Lumpur, La Malaysia. And he has a gorgeous little wife named Maggie, and they're expecting their first baby. So I guess I'm going to be a bubby <laughs> pretty well, soon. <laughs> and uh, 
then Johnny, who lives around the corner from us and keeps reappearing like a bad penny <laughs> for, for food or things like that, you know. Actually, he's, he's a lot of fun, and uh, he keeps us going. So, what does you know. he do? Um, he's a financial planner. Um, we gave him all our money, and we don't know what happened <laughs> to it, but if we need $5, we always have to <laughs> ask him. <laughs> so, anyhow, he's fun, too. And he, he's th this character. He teaches uh, spinning at... Uh, Beverly Hills uh, Racket Club. We didn't know he did that. Uh, he gets up early in the morning, teaches spinning, and then goes home and showers and puts on a business suit and goes to work. Um, so he has, a, he has a secret life, and uh, most people know about him. I guess they fight to get into his classes because he's a lot of fun and uh, in good shape. <laughs> I wanted to ask you several other questions. Do you know anything about your grandparents' background? You mentioned that your father came to Toronto, but where, where were your grandparents from? Yeah, they, they all came from Russia. My, I know mm -hmm. my grandmother came from David Hardock, so, oh. and I know there's a current group here in Detroit uh, that continues with the tradition of sort of keeping all the Hardockers together, and uh, Roz Blank is really, you know, wonderful at She's, she's just so enthusiastic. So um, I'm a member of the David Horaduck Society uh, because my grandmother was a Horaducker. Um, and so all, all my, gra my parents and I'm, my grandparents came from, you know, Russia, someplace in Russia. Um, the other ones I don't know. My, my grandmother's name was Green. My mother's mother's name was Green before she married, and she married my grandfather, whose name was White. So <laughs> we had a mixture of colors. colors. A colorful <laughs> relationship. <laughs> and you, you started to tell us about uh, your schooling, and obviously you were a good student, and you, you worked and went to school. What were some of your interests as a, a young person in, in the elementary and high school? Oh, I, I don't know. I, um, I played the violin. People don't know that about me. <laughs> I played the piano, and I played the guitar. Not, not well anymore. I mean, I... Uh, but uh, so I guess the orchestra was kind of fun. I, I actually wanted to take art classes, and you know, um, my parents were from the old school. You take classes that will get you a job, like shorthand, or you, you know, um, you, you. My father played the violin, so I, oh. I still have his violin and play it once in a while. But um, you know, he they wanted me to take violin and and. Uh, I played throughout high school in the orchestra, um, but uh, you know, I, I, I mostly took classes that were really um, useful and helped me to get into college. But uh, you know, if I had my druthers, I'd probably now take an art class because I love to to paint and draw and potchke. It's my secret stuff that no one knows about. <laughs> You're not going to show this tape to anyone, are you? Oh, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and what else did you do in school? Did you take any leadership positions as a young person? No, because in, in Ferndale, um, out of 600 kids in my graduating class, there were only four, uh, six students that were Jewish. In fact, one I still have a relationship with to this day, Cheryl Horowitz Rudin, who uh, lives in New York and Florida, and I, you know, write her, and we email now and mm -hmm. everything. But uh, um, so we really we weren't asked to participate. In fact, it was um, in those days uh, it, it wasn't underlying; it was very blatant anti-Semitism. So, um, and I came from a home that was not really religious, so I knew I was being discriminated against, but I really didn't know exactly why um, why I was so different than anybody else. In those days they used to have sororities and fraternities mm -hmm. just like they had in college. And of course you didn't even think of, you know, uh, asking to join one of those things, uh, one of those clubs. So um, it was fairly lonely. I mean we, we uh, had a club, all the Jewish kids got together and we, we thought we were really clever. We um, uh, formed a club called the Abstracts. And we wore, wore sweatshirts with big letter, scarlet letter A's on them, <laughs> <laughs> thinking that no one would get the, <laughs> the, idea. <laughs> the idea that it came from the scarlet letter. But hey, you know, we were, we were adventuresome in those days. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it was, it, it, it was a tough to be going to Ferndale. If you ask my mother, 
who's now 94, she said, oh, it was a wonderful school, but it really was not a terrific school. They didn't pay their teachers well, so um, they didn't get the cream of the crop as kids who went to, let's say, Oak Park or Mumford uh, had as, as teachers. So uh, it was tough. It was really tough. And then even when I went to Wayne um, after I graduated, those Mumford kids and those Oak Park kids sort of stuck together and they didn't uh, allow you to come into their circles. So it was fairly lonely. That's when I met Robert, who was my Prince Charming. <laughs> he came into my life when I was sitting in Spanish class and he was carrying this big, huge briefcase um, and had a, a big, huge soup ladle in it uh, that his brother had sort of made a joke and confiscated from the London Chop House, which was a very fancy restaurant. And, you know, um, so I was very curious because, as I said, I came from very meager beginnings and we didn't, we didn't, um, we didn't go to restaurants. <laughs> we couldn't afford it, you know. So my first date with him was to, to go to the uh, restaurant across the street from the London Chop House, which is oh, I, it Caucus, is, Club. Caucus Club. Oh my goodness, how could I forget that? <laughs> and uh, uh, I was just overwhelmed because I'd never been to any place like that before in my life. And uh, so I said, I guess this guy is for me. He takes <laughs> me to good places. <laughs> it's been a love affair. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we kind of like each other. <laughs> well, let's go back the to... The two outcasts, right? <laughs> to high school. Did you get involved in any Jewish activities? Or? No, the only thing I have to say is I, uh, the life-saving for me was my friend Cheryl, and there was another girl, Barbara Barris, they said, let's join BBG, and so um, we, d we had a blast. We, j we joined the BBG called Friedman BBG, which no longer exists, but it was a, a chapter from Oak Park High School, and of course, we came in there like gangbusters. We were, we <laughs> we were so glad to find a social <laughs> activity, seriously. So uh, we, you know, um, I, I liked BBG and AZA. I mean, I remember the we used to have parties together down somebody's basement <laughs> <laughs> and dance to Jan Johnny Mathis records. So you could tell I had a great time. <laughs> but uh, it, was, it was fun. And I really think that I, that was my first flavor of the, the idea that there was a Jewish community out there. I did take violin lessons when I was younger at the Jewish Community Center from um, someone who was in the um, Detroit Symphony and he gave lessons at the center. But I, I don't think I felt as much a part of that as I, my mother took me, you know, to the lessons. But I, as, as being part of BBG and suddenly waking up and realizing that I really had a place somewhere, that, that um, I didn't belong at Ferndale High School. It was terrible there. It really was. I mean, um, you know, I joined things like the French Club, but how exciting could that be? And there was really no social life, you know, there at all. Um, and there was just a few of us that kind of stuck together. So the BBG was really an awakening for me. And there were people that really enjoyed being together because they were Jewish. Mm -hmm. And um, as I said, I came from a very secular background, so um, no one judged me that I didn't know certain things about being Jewish. It was just coming together as one young Jewish person with another, a, a whole bunch of other people, so it was fun. Did you have any Jewish um, celebrations in your home? Or? We used to have a Passover once in a while, mm -hmm. but really, and you know, it's funny because I think most Jewish people do have some sort of Passover celebration. I remember my mother making an attempt at it, and we had the little um, books from Manischewitz that had the you know, story, but my father didn't speak Hebrew, and you know, it just was not something that was, it was nice to get together as a family and have dinner, but it wasn't something that we did every single year. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, when I was a kid, um, I remember when I was little, my, my parents even said we celebrated Christmas, we got Christmas gifts. So, um, and I, I know later on in life when I um, went to, uh, when I had children myself and we went to Birmingham Temple, the first thing that I did was sign up for the rabbi's class. Mm -hmm. It was a two-year study program because I really, I, I couldn't bring children into the world uh, and not have any kind of information myself. 
and I felt I was really lacking. And to this day, I, I love to take Jewish classes, sage, and all sorts of stuff like that, and you know, go to Jewish lectures just to, to learn about uh, who we are as a people. Well, it's so. very interesting because in view of your background, um, certain things had to be happening in your life you, because you have taken such important leadership roles. So what do you attribute that to? Well, I think, you know, some people have a very good feeling when they go to synagogue or temple and they feel um, a great um, contentment. And I, I know that when I first started going with Robert and his family, it felt good to go as a family, mm -hmm. but I didn't, I didn't understand what was going on. Yeah. And we went to Temple Israel, so how, mm -hmm. how complicated can that be, you know? And, and it was nice. I didn't, I, I don't mean to say that I didn't enjoy going to services, but I felt sort of out of it. I sort of feel that when I'm doing things in the Jewish community, that um, that's who, that's what makes me Jewish. Mm -hmm that that's sort of my religion. And um, uh, I have sort of a cultural historical approach to Judaism, but I can't say that I, um, and I, and I love to go to any synagogue or temple and hear the music and, and follow along and feel, feel a part of a, a larger group. Mm -hmm. But I think I get my best feelings about being Jewish is going to a, a meeting in this Federation building and sitting around with other Jewish people and helping people. And I think also because I came from very, very poor beginnings. And, you know, if I can give something back, I'm really lucky today. I mean, I, I'm gonna get tears in my <laughs> eyes, but I, I really feel that I'm very, very blessed to have what I have. So if I can give something back, it's really worthwhile. <laughs> Excuse me. And you do, <laughs> so much. <laughs> um, I'll grab this for a second, sure. excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> it, it really, I think people don't un understand. They must think I'm wacky because I do get a, a good feeling when we, I go to the archives meetings and people think, oh, she gets excited about archives. <laughs> Old paper. <laughs> <laughs> Old paper, yeah. <laughs> well, did you have any mentors? Who, how did you get going on this path of leadership? Um, I don't know. Um, it, it's an interesting question because when I came to the women's department, of course, in those days, women weren't as active in the, the general federation. And I thank goodness that trend has changed because there's some very smart women who have so much to give to this community. And they do a good job in women's division, and what's now women's department, but we weren't really allowed to be on committees in the past. There were very few women on the Board of Governors, and um, so anyhow, uh, I, Carolyn Greenberg was really the first person that I met, and Edith Jackier, and uh, these were women that were very smart women, and um, they had a lot of wonderful ideas, and it always amazes me when I go to committee meetings how people come up with these in incredibly brilliant ideas that I would have never thought of myself, so I enjoy going to all the committees and seeing, hearing people's thoughts and and actually it's it's kind of like in a sense going to my old BBG meetings because I get to be with people and we have fun and we have food and it's nice. <laughs> yeah it's nice it's very nice you know that's why I love it I just like it's like I think of it as like coming to a party every day and uh, maybe people think I'm nuts but <laughs> So I would say Carolyn Greenberg was, she's, she was a really interesting woman. Shirley Harris also, uh, she was actually, Carolyn was the president when I was, and she invited me over to her house and I got to meet her children who are now old. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, and Edith Jackier was another one. Uh, Frida Stolman was around, but I really didn't know her that well. But um, they took an interest in you, yeah, obviously. Yeah, they did, and it was, you know, um, and also, when I first started out in Federation, I really, st I had been um, working, as I said, through graduate school um, and undergraduate at a, a place called Adult Psychiatric Clinic. And I always, I think if I had to choose today, I would either have chosen a career in art or in social work or psychiatry. Because I loved, I, I, my job was to type away on a dictaphone and type all the 
reports, but they were uh, that the psychiatrists read into um, these little tapes. I mean, and I'm sure now they just talk into a microphone and it actually types it automatically on a computer, but I was the little computer <laughs> typing away. And the, the cases were just so interesting, it was just am amazing to me. So I sort of asked if I could volunteer at Jewish Family Service, and that's where I really sort of got my start. And Sam Lerner was there, so I had known him. Gosh, that was, um, Laura was just newborn, so she, she was born in 72, and then in the mid-80s, I ultimately became the president. But I hung around a lot. And people like Edith Jack here were chair of the Volunteer Services Committee, so I volunteered and we went to nursing homes. And I just really felt good about all the stuff that was going on in the community. Um, now, today, when you look at Jewish Family Service, it's, it's really grown and it uh, has two sites and uh, a new building. Um, when I first started out, it was at the Jewish Center on Myers and uh, Curtis, and it was a little building uh, sort of set aside. People don't re I maybe remember that, but there was this little time. And I remember as a young woman, I would drive there. I was so proud to be able to come to the meetings. Um, maybe people don't realize the joy that they give a young person uh, by just inviting them uh, to a meeting and uh, I, w I was happy as a clam, you know. Uh, what could be better than sort of doing something? Not, it wasn't actually therapy. I would have loved to have, as I said, been a therapist, but um, it was having some impact on people who really needed it. So. And I know that you mentioned that you were the president of the agency. And uh, Tell us a little bit more about that agency, and what, well, it does, what it did then and what it does today. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think you know. Interestingly, it it started out. I think it was in, uh, as I remember. I'm I might be wrong, but uh, uh, over the Avalon Theater, <coughs> and so you know, it started from this little storefront area, and then it then it, it moved, and now you know, it, it really started to help immigrants settle, and uh, and uh, it was part part of it was the resettlement service, which was at the time a separate agency. Um, but uh, it, it seems to me that um, when I became pr president, and even before then, we, we were helping a lot of elderly people. Um, at the time, there was not a lot of drug problems. Uh, there was not of, you didn't hear about domestic violence. Um, as the years went by, we established a uh, secret apartment where uh, women could go with their children if they were abused. Um, so there's a lot of new problems that have come along today that didn't exist or that we, we didn't want to realize that they existed in those days. So, uh, but a lot of it was just helping people who needed coping skills, whether it be immigrants or others. And, and we would give financial assistance. I remember that we had this account at uh, J.C. Penney. I think it still exists to this day for kids who needed school clothes. Um, just They would just give them an account number and a slip that said they could spend $200 and they would go to J.C. Penney and be able to pick out something of their own, you know. And so I think, I'm sure that we're doing things differently at Jewish Family Service. I know that when I was president, they had a transportation service and they didn't charge anybody anything. And we now the transportation service has grown over there and they drive, I don't know how many people. I mean, just huge numbers of especially elderly people because as the population ages, people can't drive themselves anymore. <clears throat> but now they're charging for it. It's a nominal fee because what they discovered was that people who um, made an appointment for the um, service, uh, they figured, well, they're not paying for it, so they didn't call to cancel, so the driver would show up. Mm -hmm. So this gives them the responsibility if they've paid for it, even if it's only two dollars uh, for the transportation, that they ought to um, make sure that if they cancel, they, they call. It gives them, them a responsibility. Uh, so I know that they do charge for a number of the services that they didn't charge for before. We just gave it to people. Mm -hmm especially immigrants who had, came with nothing. And now they have to have, uh, <clears throat> I think they have to have um, sponsoring families who 
actually puts forth some money, uh, and I think the Jewish Family Service somehow matches it um, so that they can settle. There's not as many Russians coming. When I was president, there were a lot, number of Russians coming. I mean, that was like a big influx, and once they came, many of them didn't have the skills uh, and jobs that they needed. And uh, one of the th things I think we, we made a mistake in is that we didn't involve them in the Jewish communities as such. And I, I, in hindsight, I think when the entire community looks back, they say, gee, it was a, a group of people that we missed because um, we, we didn't uh, involve them as much as we could have in the Jewish community. And it's hard because they, they all came with, lang they needed language skills, they needed uh, you know, uh, jobs, they needed basic, basic things and adjusting to a, a whole new culture. And my husband actually at the time, uh, he's just, he's a very quiet, loving man and he, he was teaching uh, English to Russians as they came and he really enjoyed it, sort of a hands-on experience. So, um, but family service has changed and it's grown in some of the things that they're doing. I'm sure there were drug problems, you know, 20 years ago, but I think that it, it's become more prevalent and people are talking about it. Also, you know, people have health insurance, but it only covers uh, to a certain point, especially in terms of psychiatric care. So um, we have people who've started out in therapy and then suddenly they have to they realize their money has run out, but they still need the therapy. And uh, so that, that, a lot of that has changed as well. But now we're in West Bloomfield. Who would have thought that people in West Bloomfield have, and the Birmingham area have problems, but they have the same problems as we, we do. And, and when I was president, we got a huge grant from Skillman um, to help young mothers, uh, single mothers. Now. 20 years later, being a single parent is a fairly common thing, um, but then it wasn't. And there were young women, um, now women have children who are, and they're not uh, even divorced, they're n they've never been married. Mm -hmm. So, but it was teaching these young, tr young women skills. Um, and some of them are, you know, I remember um, I didn't obviously participate in the group therapy that they had, but um, I remember being in the building and one young mother, uh, I thought she was carrying a handbag and I looked down and she was actually carrying her baby by the arm. Um, because, the, and um, one of the things when they had the group therapy, the therapist told us, uh, the person who was leading the program, uh, she told us that they had to feed the mothers first before um, the babies because the mothers had to take care of their own physical needs before they would even think about caring for their children. So we have all the problems that the rest of the society has. And some of the, some of them, I, when you asked about mentors, you know, there were some people at Jewish Family Service who were, uh, I just admired them. They, uh, Marilyn Hertzberg was one of them. So uh, just admired all the work that they did and was sort of, envious in some ways that they, they could work and have a family as well. So. Well, you've done a great deal of work. I know that not only locally, but throughout the world, and you have very strong connections to Israel. You've been well, mis a mission chair. And hanging around Israel is fun. <laughs> <laughs> what was your first trip? <laughs> oh, 1969. We were married a year, and we went on the Detroit Service Group mission with uh, Ruthie Broder. In fact, it was wonderful. We went 30 years later, and we had lunch on the, the veranda at the King David again 30 years later when she was mission chair and for one of the Michigan Miracle Missions in, in uh, 99. And uh, it, was, it was just a great feeling to be there uh, with her and think, my God, we've, we've been there so many times. I mean, I, I think I've been there 17 times. But we went the first time and I was just totally amazed. Uh, I had I'd never thought quite understood, uh, you know, as I said, I, it's, it's probably, I'm trying to explain this, but when I went to BBG, I was just like taken over by the feeling that there was another group of people that, and I really belonged there. Well, I know many people feel this way when you go to Israel and the plane, you know, puts the first uh, 
tire on the runway and you land and they start playing Hatikva in, on the plane. I, I just, the whole, the whole trip was just overwhelming to me. Um, we, we went though uh, first to Israel with the Detroit Service Group and Carolyn Greenberg was there and Hugh and Ruthie Broder and Brewster and uh, uh, you know a few other people. Um, and uh, then we went to Mauthausen, we went to Austria. And that was the second part of the trip. And usually groups go there first and then it's sort of from the darkness into the light. But uh, we went from the light into the darkness. And I remember that it was just, uh, it was just too much. I couldn't speak for a couple of days after I got back. I really just was so overwhelmed by the emotion of being at a concentration camp. And I actually went again a few years later to Mauthausen with um, the National Young Leadership. Larry Jack here was the chair of the mission, and so we had to go. <laughs> so um, he, um, we went with 500 other young people. I, I was young in those days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I remember going to Mauthausen and feeling a lot better about being there, only because when we went the first time, it was a very small group of people and it was very, it was overwhelmingly sad. It was just uh, to realize what had happened there. And although Israel was wonderful, um, this sort of uh, reminded us of where we had been. And it was, it was bad, it was, it was hard. Um, uh, and then when we, I went again with uh, Robert and Larry Jack here and Shelly Jack here and uh, just a whole group of Detroiters, Richard Krugel and Everybody was on that mission, and we've still been friendly with everybody. So uh, anyhow, it, w it was a, a, a better way of seeing um, our history. Uh, and uh, I was there for the 25th anniversary with Robert. That was okay. kind of a neat trip. We went on the Queen Elizabeth II, which was docked in Haifa and Ashdod, and that was the ship that uh, Sadat was supposed to blow up. Um, so every night uh, um, they would send Jewish frogmen over the side of the boat to see if there were any bombs that had been planted that day. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, thank goodness there wasn't. I guess he changed his mind. But it was very eerie to be on this luxurious uh, airliner for the 20th, uh, uh, ship, excuse me, not airliner. And then to, um, you know, come back from Israel, which was, you know, sandals and, uh, grubby blue jeans, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was fun, it was fun. They were, and th you know, through the years, through the different trips that we've been on, we've just made such incredible friends. We've, the Jacobsons, Nancy and Joe, and, and uh, Marcy and Michael Feldman, we've been with them on a number of trips. So you, you share these incredible experiences and uh, you bond together with people. Just like we do here in the in this building, mm -hmm. I mean, you you have wonderful experiences with people. I know that you've led some missions. Do you want to talk about the family missions and the uh, the community missions that you've been involved in? Uh, well, the the one that they, they actually put me in charge of was uh, <laughs> <laughs> Edie Slatkin and I, who's just a dear dear friend. She and I we took a group of Hadracha women, sixteen women, and uh, we had just. I think every mission has been wonderful, only because, uh, well, for several reasons. You 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 go to Israel, which what, you know what could be better than that? And every time you go, it changes. There's something new added, or there's some there's some wonderful thing that they've done, or they have a new sound and light show in the old city, or you know they have a new park that they've built, and and the people are wonderful. And and the second thing is that you take first-timers usually, and the Hadraha group were mostly first-time women. And uh, I'd never been on a trip like that with women, and it was very emotional. Um, it was just very exciting, and I was responsible for these people. So uh, I, I remember, you know, uh, uh, just, it, it, I can't, the whole trip was just, just being with these women, and we did all sorts of different things. Um, one of the women had been there as a teenager, and she reconnected with her old flame from the kibbutz. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, that was a little interesting, because we had to try to physically put her on the plane to go home. 
uh, but uh, she she had she her mother made her come back the first time, and we made her come oh. back the <laughs> second time. <laughs> and I think she would be there now if she could. But that was an interesting experience. But we just all bonded. It was it was really nice. And as I said, to take first timers and see their faces, and and I feel like they're opening a special gift that you've given them. So. Uh, each time has been good, well, you know, and we've been to Europe also, so that's very interesting. You know, when we first went uh, to Prague, we went with Larry Jackier and his dad. His dad was one of the leaders, and we had a blast. We just had so much fun. Um, but it was a different Czechoslovakia. It was before uh, their freedoms, and uh, so and everything was really, it, it was a very closed society. It's, it's very hard to describe it, but uh, you know, it was very colorless there, even though this, the city of Prague is very beautiful, because it, it wasn't bombed uh, during the wars, uh, World War II. So the second time, though, we went, um, it was like a different city. Uh, it was just, a, I don't know if you know, Prague is the marionette capital of the world, so there were marionettes <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> We actually have one in our home, but uh, it was just a different feeling. The whole, the whole sense of the trip, and at that point, you know, Jews were kind of coming out of the woodwork, and you saw this rejuvenation of Jewish cultural life, and um, it, 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 it's continued. I know we've been to the former Soviet Union, and they have now Hillel's all over the area. Uh, they have what they call Chesed's, which are really Jewish centers, but they're not Jewish centers in the sense that we know our Jewish center is our health club and some classes and the Shalom Street, but there they have, uh, um, they, they, it's hard to describe, people go there for haircuts, they go there for social services, they go there for food, um, uh, and it, I'm sure you've heard the experience from other people, they, they have sort of a Meals on Wheels and they deliver packages to people who can't get out of their homes. And I remember visiting one woman um, who hadn't been out of her apartment for five years and because she just couldn't walk up and down the stairs. And she lived in an apartment where um, in Russia there's oftentimes a, 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 about five or six apartments in a circular area and then the center is like the bathroom and the kitchen and they all share that so they're uh, and they're squeezed into these little rooms and so we went and visited her and took her food and uh, I remember she I had a walker and um, she said you know they don't sell these walkers here they don't have walkers um, this came from the United States and this came from the Chesed they're they're giving me this walker I would be dead by now I wouldn't be able to get up and walk around my apartment had I not had this walker and you know she had somebody visit her at least once a week to make sure she was okay and um, you know and I don't know if people know that in the former Soviet Union uh, they used to if you if you had a child they oftentimes sent that child to a completely different area of the country to work and uh, to go to school and so families were really split up uh, very easily and uh, so she did have a son but she didn't know where he was uh, so it's it's a hard life there, um, and so to feel like you're a, a little tiny piece of that whole um, process, you know, uh, I, th I think it's incredible. And I'm sure that this gave you such a passion for spreading the message and uh, doing the kinds of fundraisings that you do. Yeah, I like to fundraise. Yeah. I probably the one of the few people that do, but I'm not asking for myself, so. You know, uh, if I if I ask somebody else, it's it's not for me. It's f because I know I was in that position once when I was a BBG girl, and somebody had to ask for money in order to keep the thing going and uh, for all the things. Even the Jewish Center when I took violin lessons. So um, my parents weren't savvy enough. I think I would have been a great camper, <laughs> <laughs> party girl that I am. <laughs> well, I know. Yeah, Ezra is one. Your favorite um, yeah agencies yeah. and, and yeah. so tell us about that and your involvement there. Well, it's funny because Leah Luger and I go back about 12 years now. I remember Yad Ezra when it was like in a basement storefront thing on Ten Mile Road in Oak Park and in um, yeah I think it's Oak Park or Southfield right on the corner of Ten and uh, 
Greenfield. They were in a basement uh, area, and they used to pass the food down through the window, um, and it was very s small beginnings. And uh, they, they actually had a problem. They, uh, they were feeding a lot of Russians who were coming over, as well as elderly people. But the Russians uh, had very different food tastes, so they really didn't like pre peanut butter and jelly. They didn't quite understand how we got this concept of smooshing up peanuts and making a butter out of it. So, uh, you know, they had to sort of change the menu to fit the, the clients that they were serving. But then they, they moved to another building and, you know, was, I, and Leah came on and I was sort of a newcomer there too. And we did the first, I was the first dinner chair, you know, and uh, so that, that was good and it was fun. And um, the thing that I like to do is oftentimes stuff that uh, where you, you f I, well, you feel like you have some impact on the organization. And I'm a pretty good typist having typed up all those transcripts <laughs> for those darn doctors <laughs> that I worked for for six years. So I, um, I w uh, offered to type in some names into the computer system, their new little computer system. And I don't know that much about computers, but I do know how to type. And so uh, when she came on, we sort of started up this whole database. And that was fun. I worked a lot of hours there just typing like a mad woman. But um, uh, it was helpful to them. So it, it really got them started. Uh, and uh, you know, now computers are the, th who would have thought that we would have been so uh, married to computers. But uh, you know, it, we couldn't have done the whole list for Yad Ezra. And then, you know, I worked on the dinners and I was an honoree. <laughs> As I said, I've had some honors which have been very nice, but I, I find them a little embarrassing. Because uh, I, I, if anybody knew how happy I was <laughs> doing this stuff, uh, uh, and I hope other people feel this way too. You know, the, the honor is just the icing on the cake. It's, uh, it, it's fun to just be, as I said, with people and knowing that you're doing something that's hopefully a little important and has some impact on somebody. Is Jazz Ezra as important today as it was? Oh then? yeah, I, I, last year I did the, um, I uh, see as I said, I have this other secret life mm -hmm. where I'm an artist, so I did the cover for the dinner program and the invitation and I'm doing, in fact I just turned it in, mm -hmm. Leah said, where is it, where is it, I need it. Uh, so I just finished the the cover for the ad book and uh, it came out pretty nicely, I must say. It has to be different than the last one, so that was fun. Well, you're very creative and obviously no. uh, that was one of the reasons that drew you to Birmingham Bloomfield Art Association. Yeah, it was fun. I like it. I, I hung around there a long time and they said, oh, okay, we'll make her the president. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that, I love that place. Uh, when I first uh, uh, started to have children, uh, I took a class with Robert there. Um, we took pottery and we'd come home absolutely filthy dirty from the pottery. <laughs> we'd have to take off our clothes <laughs> which was a lot of fun. <laughs> Maybe you want to cut that out of the tape. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, so then I started taking painting classes with a fellow named uh, Robert Wilbert who was the head of the department at Wayne and he would teach classes. You know, a lot of uh, artists augment their incomes by teaching classes there and it gives them exposure to people who uh, might come to their shows and buy their works so I started taking class from him and I, to, today I'm still taking classes oh, yeah. from him he he stopped teaching for a while and then about 30 years later here he is teaching after his retirement he's uh, teaching one day on Tuesdays it's my hiding place no one can find me on Tuesdays because I take this class and I paint and didn't you have some professional involvement there also? Yeah, well, um, you know, it's interesting. From you, I learned how to do archives, so I've been working on their archives. I still am doing that. In fact, we're going to have a 50th anniversary celebration in 2007, so we're working towards getting the archives. It's in pretty good shape, I have to say. I'm very proud. Thanks to you <laughs> and your tutelage, I, you know, was able to sort of get it into some semblance. 50 years of stuff, you know. Um, but um, I was president, uh, it's been a while ago, and uh, it's grown since then. Uh, my 
job was to get it through the building process. And um, I have to brag that I know about every nook and cranny in that mm -hmm. building. And it's built on an old water treatment plant site. So it has some huge, huge tanks on the property, which uh, we were going to excavate and make into classrooms. And mm -hmm. actually, the back buildings, which we just completed a few years ago, and that's when I was president, we, we got through the completion of that. Um, they're actually built on huge water tanks that as the foundation. They didn't have to lay any foundations. They just built the building on, on top of the tanks. But um, it's been an interesting experience. Um, and, uh, you know, I've enjoyed it. And I, I like to do art there. It's fun. It, it, like anything else, it's uh, uh, you get together with people. And you see, especially there, you know, there's always exhibitions going on. and. Uh, it's even neat to see some of the kids, the artwork that they do. Uh, and they give classes in just literally everything, uh, jewelry and sculpture, pottery, you name it. And now they have the uh, Eisenhower Dance Company there mm -hmm. as well. So it's you, people dancing around <laughs> and <laughs> people fun, creating. Fun. Just you, you, get, you get stimulated by all the artwork that's just hanging there and, and realize the exciting thing about the human mind and what it can do. Yeah, so it, it's fun. And, and you, uh, among your many honors, you received uh, the Heart of Gold, and you received, <laughs> and, and we all know you I was going to wear it all heart. today. I oh, you <laughs> and, and you also received an honor from the Jewish Historical Society for yes, uh, the Leonard and, and, and Simons Simon. Jewish yes, History I Award. wish you, I would have known Leonard and Simons because he had a real vision, and that's something that is when you, when you see somebody like that in the community, they're an inspiration uh, that he had this vision for an archives and that he knew of the importance of preserving. N now I know that, but at the time I didn't realize how important, you know, even these, these documents are that we're doing, these, these wonderful tapes. And, uh, you know, I've been privileged to be in some of the, the tapes and you really learn from your elders and what they have to teach and their visions and what they went through in order to be the people that they are. So um, I think the archives are incredibly important. I'm glad we did this project because I think that hopefully 40 years from now, I mean we have some old tapes that we're looking at from somebody who did them a few years ago, hopefully 40 years from now we'll look at those same tapes and, uh, that we did today and, and say, whoa, th this, is, th this is really neat. This is, what was, this is a little snapshot of what was happening at the time and how it got to be here. Because if you look at 1900 uh, and you look at the Jewish community, there probably were a few haters and a few kosher caterers. Uh, now when you look our, our, at our Jewish community a century later in 2005 I mean all the wonderful agencies we have and camps and you know uh, and things that we don't have we we used to have a hospital but we don't have it anymore uh, so I think that all these things are especially archives are so important I know you're working on the Sinai collection uh, from our once Jewish hospital and uh, so I, I think that people will understand the it, it's it's very hard to close up an agency uh, Usually, uh, communities don't do that. The, the agencies just keep going and going until I don't know what. But we've we've actually closed agencies, closed closed uh, Borman Hall. Uh, you know, things are different. I mean, the way we even care for our elderly is so different today than it was a hundred years ago. Uh, my grandmother, I remember, was uh, uh, in the old folks' home on uh, you know. Um, in, near Dexter and Davison and as a kid I remember visiting her but that was a different it, it wasn't a medical facility it was just a place where older people lived now today we have a whole panorama of you know whole rainbow of services that we offer elderly people uh, depending on what they need it's, it's not just that we put a little building there and put some old people there we really there are people who are thinking about this and planning for this, so, and I know we're doing a new demographic study. I was involved in the demographic study uh, a few years ago. It was amazing to see how many Jews we actually had in our community, 
and how things are changing. You know, uh, Jews have intermarried. Uh, we have a, a, you know, how are we going to approach all of these problems? I hope I'm around for another hundred years so I can <laughs> see what the, what the Jewish community is going to be like. It's really fascinating. But we started out with really nothing, with a few, as I said, a few shuls and a few haters and Jews, you know, boys were bar mitzvahed, but not girls. I mean, God forbid a girl should have a bat mitzvah. Now it's it's just amazing what we have women rabbis and uh, it's just the whole, I'm, I'm describing, I'm sure, something that everybody knows, but it is amazing uh, how we, especially in Detroit, when, when you I'm talk about Israel, when you go to Israel, uh, they've heard about Detroit. When you meet people um, from the general community at large in the United States, they know about Detroit. Detroit is really the example of uh, what ought to be. And yeah, we've made a few mistakes, but I think we have some incredible things that are happening in this community and continue to happen. So, you know, I, I feel privileged to be a proud member of uh, this community. And you've also been taking leadership roles as a campaign chair and working on um, uh, the endowment funds yeah. and the foundation. Yeah, as so I said, I like to ask message? for <laughs> What's your message when you go <laughs> to meet with I don't uh, know. I'm still Egypt. involved at, at Hillel and Metro Detroit because I went to Wayne and mm -hmm. I realized how important it is for, uh, especially uh, having come from Ferndale, for young Jewish people to find a spot someplace. In the, you know, a lot of the young people at Hillel of Metro Detroit are people who are in the med school or the, you know, there there are very few undergraduate students anymore. That's that's a change in our community. They, we have, I think, more Jewish professors at Wayne than we have Jewish students. Mm -hmm. But they're all scattered all over this community. So it's neat if you're the person that can provide, I don't know, they have Shabbat services, they have potluck dinners, they have, they go to plays together, they, they do all, they make min uh, mezuzahs for, the old folks uh, and, and Fleischmann and it's, you know, if, if you can be part of that, what a neat thing. But, uh, and I am active in BBYO, what did I know? <laughs> <laughs> Here I am still wanting to belong to BBYO. I get vicarious thrills out of <laughs> going to BBYO meetings. But uh, yeah, there's, there's about uh, over a thousand kids that belong to this organization just like I did when I was, maybe there's a, Maybe there's another person like me in there who mm -hmm. will just love to, to be part of the community. Uh, yeah. Who are some of the people that you remember uh, on those trips to Israel? Oh, on the trips to Israel. Well, as I mentioned, Ruthie. She was, she's been a longtime friend, Ruthie Broder. And uh, you know, Larry Jack Year was, uh, you know, they, they've all been longtime friends because we all marched around together mm -hmm. in all sorts of different lands, mm -hmm. foreign lands. Uh, I think that I think the one person that sticks that on my mind is, is somebody that I always wanted to emulate was was David Hermelin. I mean, he w we were on the first Michigan Miracle Mission, and Bob Aronson had this incredible idea to take as many people as he could cram into three airplanes, uh, and we took 1,284 people on that first mission. And David Hermelin just, um, in spite of the fact that he he was, uh, uh, you know, he ha had a lot of positions, and he he was chair of ORT, and he was uh, uh, head of this mission. He was the the, the chair, and we were like co-chairs, uh, Conrad Giles and myself, and Larry Jackier, and Jane Sherman. I just I felt I was in the presence of someone who was very 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 talented and very special in the way he dealt with people, and. Um, uh, on the mission, I used to handle the lost and found every day and <laughs> remind people whose sweater is this and who left their hat and, you know, Gush Etzion and, you know, uh, uh, and at breakfast. And he would, every morning at the hotel, he would just get people so enthusiastic and this, he, he'd just be the, the crowd pleaser and he'd, he'd, be, he'd be raising spirits and making jokes and uh, he did it with I mean, everybody just loved him. He did it with such ease uh, and such, 
he, he, he had this special talent. I, I don't think you see that in, in very many people. Uh, he, he just had a special way of dealing with people. And of course, Doreen is so lovely, and she's, she's a wonderful, she was a wonderful uh, compliment to him. But I remember going to see them in Norway just before they got sick. We went on a mission and stopped there. And we were so tired when we got off the plane. And he had kosher hot dogs and <laughs> French fries that he made himself. I mean, he's, he was just. And then the next day, we were invited back to their home in Norway. Uh, the whole group was. It was ben and Marty Rosenthal were there, and Larry and, and uh, Larry Jackier and Eleanor, and just a, you know, a whole host of us, Michael Horowitz. And we all went to uh, the home again. And he had this incredibly, the whole place had been transformed, and he had other groups there. And he had, um, uh, he, he um, had transformed the place, but he, it felt so warm. I mean, he, they had taken out all the couches and all the furniture and put tables, and there were about, I don't know, 150 people that Doreen <laughs> served dinner to. I mean, she's so, always so gracious and kind. Um, and I remember uh, we, we went to another dinner after that, um, and he was doing another group from another city and place. And uh, it was at a hotel, and the singer hadn't shown up for the entertainment. And he <laughs> literally got up and started singing what he said was his and Doreen's love song. And he started singing, um, I'm Nudnik the Fine Schissel, I want to <laughs> fly around the world a Bissel, you know. <laughs> and he was just hilarious. He had people on the floor so that when the actual <laughs> entertainment came, they didn't want to hear her. She, you know, they were, they, they were willing to listen to David because he was so humorous and just... Uh, just the best, just really the best. I, you know, I think this community really misses him. So, anyhow, it's hard to talk after yeah, that. Yeah, he's really he's he, a, was, he was a neat guy. Yeah. Um, several other things that you have participated in that have really had an impact on this community. One is the Sage program. Yeah, Sage. What, what seminars? Can you tell us about that uh, on adult Jewish enrichment. Well, as I said, for me that this was like probably. One of the most important things, I, you know, that I felt that I was involved in my friend Sharon Hart was uh, with Erwin Alterman were the originators of this program. And they had seen this program in Atlanta called Jewish U or something like that, I think. And uh, so they, they sort of copied the, f the footprint of the program. But it was to just once a year give adults in the community uh, three or four week uh, courses in anything you can imagine, from Jewish cooking to uh, the Kabbalah, you know. Uh, um, so, uh, and we got the uh, rabbis to teach. They agreed to teach the classes, which was wonderful. And for me, it, it was like, it was so much fun to work on this, only because, you know, I, 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 Jewish education for adults is so important. And especially, I didn't have any Jewish ed education at all. But for people who did, who are my age, they always have some bitterness or they, they didn't like it or they wanted to quit or they only did it to get through the bar mitzvah. And so here we are once again, you know, having these, we would give three nights a week, uh, different classes each night for four weeks. And we, you know, it was fun to plan the programs and to get all the rabbis and teachers in the community to participate. And then we had, in between classes, uh, we have cake and coffee. That was fun because people got together. That was just almost as important as the classes themselves. People got together and felt that they belonged to a particular group. And we discovered that a lot of the people that took the SAGE class weren't affiliated with, with, te with temples or synagogues. And then many of them, uh, a huge percentage of them, actually went on to Melton which is their year, the year, Federation's year-long program uh, for Jewish education. And so like when we look even today, uh, in 2005, we have about 100 people that are signed up for Melton for the fall. And I would say at least half of those took SAGE classes. So it was like an entree. And people who were afraid of Jewish education or had a bad experience or didn't have any Jewish education at all, Suddenly they're taking classes and they're saying, you know what, this is really nice. I understand it now. When I was, you know, 10 years old, it didn't seem so great, but now I, it, I enjoy doing this. So, 
you know, in the past we've had six or seven hundred people sign up for classes. Uh, we're changing the program a little this year, so uh, we're going to have stage for all seasons and try to have some particular thing. We're going to have the classes in the springtime again, but we're mm -hmm. going to have something all year round so people, if they want to, can just get a dabbling of Jewish education. And uh, it's interesting because I thought, okay, it's going to be the same people who sign up year after year. It's not. Uh, we get people that we've never seen before. I would say only a small percentage are repeaters. We have people that just, all of a sudden they look and say, gee, I can take a class. Isn't that neat? I can come together at, at the Jewish Center and take a class with other Jewish people and, uh, and sort of reconnect. So it's been terrific. It's had an impact. Yeah. And uh, the other thing I do is with Anita Naftali, uh, I, we, I've been chair, see I hang on as chair for a long time <laughs> as you know, with archives I'm there for the <laughs> a <Aloha>. lifetime. <laughs> I'm a lifer. <laughs> but with Anita also, she she's incredible. She, uh, like yourself, she's just the consummate professional and she, she does uh, work with kids with special needs and we have a program um, a few years back uh, some people in the community looked and said, there are kids in this community who are not coming to after school programs at the synagogues or temples, or they're not attending um, our Jewish day schools because they have special needs and we have not addressed their situations and how we can welcome them. And so uh, we have 23 teachers in all of the different uh, after school and day school programs and they kind of shadow the kids. You wouldn't, you would think that they were just a helper in the classroom, but they are uh, young women uh, who have uh, special ed degrees, so they have master's degrees. We don't have any men. We just, mm -hmm. uh, it would be nice, but mm -hmm. we, we, we don't have them. But they are in the classrooms, and they help those special needs kids to get through um, the, this, the uh, religious programs. But, um, so we probably help, uh, well la this past year I, we helped over 700 and we think this year it's going to be about 800 kids. And one of the new things we started was uh, a, an early childhood uh, recognition of kids with special needs. So we're now in the preschool, we're looking at kids who are two and three years old who are going to our Sharat Tzedek or Temple Israel and we're identifying them. and trying to help them early because what happens is they may have a problem with dyslexia or uh, you know they might have uh, some mild case of autism. If we can catch that early then we help them to avoid the stigma mm -hmm. later on of being different in the classroom and if we catch it early it's oftentimes retrainable and we can we can help them through it. Um, if you don't catch it early then when they're 10 years old, it's, it's very sad, but they, they have all sorts of other social problems and they have emotional problems because they're not accepted. Uh, they're just different. It's, they learn differently. So um, it's very exciting. And uh, so I, I'm the chairman that sort of oversees th that, those teachers and that program. And uh, then we have a, a sort of an adjunct committee called Family Circle Committee. And we have programs for the parents because mm -hmm. As you can imagine, um, every Jewish parent wants to have the perfect child and then suddenly this child is born and you notice that the child is a little different. It, 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 needs, it needs help in different areas that oftentimes our parents are not able to, to know about. So we have these special programs and we invite experts to come in to talk with the parents. It's very satisfying. Um, I see Anita. She's constantly barraged with questions from parents who um, just, uh, you know, they just want to be so, they, they want to know everything. Are they giving their child the right medication and are they, are, are, do they have them in the right uh, setting for school and uh, sh is there something else they could be doing for them after school? So she's always um, helping and working with the parents and we provide those special like programs that bring in an expert or, you know, somebody that uh, deals with kids with special needs. We're doing one uh, in November, um, actually on my birthday, uh, that's about called the bully, the bullied, and the bystanders. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes 
uh, they, as bystanders, we enable the bully to have his power or her power. So it's going to be interesting. I always learn. I, I'm, a, I, you know, I just go and as I said, I, I'm, I guess I'm in a daze all the time, <laughs> <and> amazed <laughs> by everything that. Uh, that I'm involved in, you know, it just it's really learning with archives and with special needs and Jewish education. It's 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 a good rich life. There's so many positive things that are happening in this community. Yeah, but what there do you is. think are our problems and our critical needs? Well, um, I I don't I, I'm I'm a member of Birmingham Temple, so um, in our temple we have a number of people. Uh, who are intermarried, and uh, I know that our rabbis believe that uh, when a couple comes to you and they say they want to get married, uh, they they've already decided that, and uh, it's hard to ask the person who's not Jewish to negate um, all that they've learned throughout their life. So the, our rabbis, I don't say that they insist, but they strongly suggest that they take this two-year program that I took uh, mm -hmm. and uh, what the first year is uh, Jewish philosophy and the second year is the the history of the Jews and uh, the f it, in the philosophy part they teach them how to celebrate Jewish holidays and the beauty of, of the rituals that we have and um, oftentimes and then after that there's like a, a commitment ceremony or a con it's a conversion but it's not a conversion in the um, in the traditional sense so you know some Jews may not feel comfortable with what we do but we do have a number of couples who come regularly and in fact uh, uh, our media past president was someone who uh, uh, Mr. Uh, you know, his name is Sims but he, he's, he wasn't Jewish and he became the president of our temple because he and his wife decided that this was where they wanted to be and they wanted their children to be there. So I think that maybe um, there may be some adjustment and maybe just like we have female rabbis and female cantors where we never had them before, maybe, maybe some people will change and understand uh, what's happening at the Birmingham Temple. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm very, uh, I feel like I belong there mm -hmm. because I didn't have the Jewish upbringing. So as I said, for me to go there and take their classes and say, wow, I mean, it, it's a cultural, historical mm -hmm. approach to Judaism. And there's other organizations like that. We're not the only one, um, although Rabbi Wine has had a great impact. You know, there's always been the uh, Workman Circle and Jewish Parents mm -hmm. Institute. So there have been other organizations. but. I think when you look at our population, I don't know what the new study is going to show, but the old demographic study, there were, um, I think it was 50% who are, who, no, 40% who are affiliated and 60% who are not affiliated with any kind of synagogue or temple. Well, where are those 60%? Where, and they said we had 96,000 people in this Jewish community. Well. It's about 50,000 people that are not affiliated in any way. So I think we have to be um, hopefully creative as we've been in other areas. I mean, look at the way we care for our elderly now that we, we didn't do before, the way we care for our special needs kids. I think it's going to come to reaching out to a non-Jewish community and embracing them in a different way than we've done before. So. We have to work on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know what the answer is, but uh, you know, <laughs> I, I think that w w if we were hopefully around in 50 years from now, we'll look back yeah. and say, look, we went through a transition, just like we've done with in other areas, you know, uh, and, and uh, we've changed. We've become more accepting, and uh, uh, I think it's going to be a, an interesting time. It always is. Susie, we're coming to the end of our uh, interview. I, I wanted to ask you if there's anything that I have forgotten to ask. No, I just want to mention my husband who... Uh, <laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> if I don't mention him, I'm in deep doo-doo. <laughs> no, he's, he's such a nice, nice, even-tempered fellow. I don't know how I got him. <laughs> Pulled the wool over his <laughs> eyes. <laughs> we have a lot of fun together. And, and uh, I couldn't do what I do without his support and his, you know, 
and he, he's he's a, he's very active also very quietly but he does his Hebrew free loan and is uh, you know as I said he taught English and uh, to newcomers and he does v things he delivers meals yeah. for Yad Ezra he just wants to sort of just do something nice every so often so uh, so yeah. I have to thank him and do you have a message for either the community or for your family oh my goodness <laughs> <laughs> see for my family move back home so I can <laughs> see you <laughs> that's another problem you know we, we in this Jewish community and we we make it so wonderful the world out there is just like a, a candy land and uh, we send our kids away to school and to to New York to live out the big adventure and then they're not here so uh, I guess I, w I would say I, I miss them sometimes mm -hmm. I mean wh I, we talk to each other every day practically and we have a lot of fun but I do wish they lived around the corner like like one of them so I can see them more often but uh, any message for the community I don't I don't know I, I mean I, as I said uh, this this community is such an incredible community and it has a reputation globally for uh, its creative stuff that it does you know um, so I hope that uh, you know I'm, 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 as I said I want to be around for a long time so that I can see all the good stuff that's going to happen I certainly hope you are and thank you so much oh. for all of your your wisdom this was so much day. fun <laughs> I didn't know I could talk this long <laughs>